exhibition. First of all, thanking Barbara and Arthur for sponsoring this exhibit. <laughs> so, uh, Sandy is a nationally recognized photographer who has exhibited her photographs in museums and galleries throughout the United States, including at the Art Institute of Chicago, the De Cordova Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts, Museum of Modern Art, uh, Museum of Contemporary Photography, Southeast Museum of Photography, St. Louis Art Museum. <laughs> And her work is held in several private and public collections, including the Brooklyn Museum, the George Eastman House, the High Museum, the Library of Congress, Los Angeles County Museum, Museum of Modern Art, and the New Britain Museum. And she is a multiply published and has several monographs, including the 2009 Charter monographs of grids and multiple image installations, which we'll hear more about, called Walking Through the World. Uh, and the, of course the book from this exhibit, Between Planting and Picking, and we have several of her books here available for sale if you'd like a signed copy. <laughs> uh, her work um, has also appeared in several themed exhibit catalogs like Fabrication, Staged, Altered, and Appropriate pho Appropriated Photographs by Anne Hoy, Abbeville, 1988. Picture in California by Teresa Heyman, Oakland Museum, 1989. The Defining Eye, Women Photographers of the 20th Century, which I did for the Art Museum, which is based on Helen Formula's collection. And uh, Photography of Invention, MIT Press. And her work is represented in New York by Rick Wester, Fine Art, and in Boston by Gallery Kaifas. How's that pronounced? Okay. Either way, everyone okay. mixes that one up. So without further ado, um, Olivia. Olivia, thank you. Oh, I got my strings here mixed up. Thank you, Olivia, for your very generous comments. And um, thanks to you, as well as Becky, for all the work that went into bringing planting and picking here. I'm really thrilled to have it at the Sheldon. And um, I know what an effort it is to get the work on the walls. And it looks fantastic. And I'm very pleased. So thank you. Um, before I get to the slides, which will basically show you a trajectory of the work from the beginning all the way to my most recent work, which is in, after the threshold, I just want to tell you a little bit about how I got started with the medium of photography. And I want to share a little bit about some thoughts behind After the Threshold because it really explains a bit of the journey. Um, I first started to take pictures when I was 15. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, and I went to a small boarding school in upstate New York. And when I arrived at this school, I was petrified. I felt like a fish out of water. I was very uncomfortable. And I remember clear as a bell seeing a young girl who had a Canon FTB camera around her neck. And in 1971, the Canon FTB was a state-of-the-art SLR camera. And though, I don't know what it was, but I thought if I had one of those cameras, everything would be OK at this place. Well, I didn't get the camera right away, but I did enroll in a photography class. And the school had a fantastic department. And it turned out to be an incredibly fortuitous experience because instead of handing us SLR cameras, the teacher handed us a Diana camera, which today is a bit of a cult classic. You probably know of it as the Holga. Um, but, um, and, and the camera is, is totally plastic. It sounds like this. It has three shutters, three uh, aperture settings, sunny, partly cloudy, and cloudy. And what turned out to be so fortuitous is the sensibility of the Diana camera. The Diana allows for a lot of um, interpretation. It's very ambiguous, and it has a very dreamy quality. And that sensibility, regardless of what work I have done through the years, except for planting and picking, um, uh, all of the work has had that feeling, that kind of, of dreaminess about it. Um, I went on to get an MFA at um, RIT in Rochester. And while there, I also took classes at um, Visual Studies Workshop, where the founder, Nathan Lyons, was teaching. And Nathan Lyons' work has a lot to do with sequence. So when one puts one image up against the other, what happens? How does it change the image? Do they collide? Do they connect? Act, how do they talk to each other? And that kind of dialogue has been important to me for 30 plus years. So um, 
in after the threshold, I started with a paradigm of either three or four images on one sheet of paper. Becky, we could slip to the next slide, please. Um, and in the beginning of the book, I borrowed a quote from the Gestalt psychologist, Kurt Kafka. And Kafka said, the whole is other than the sum of the parts. It's a little bit of a misconception that we use the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I don't know a lot about psychology, but, but the Gestalt psychologists based most of their principles on sensory perception and motion. So, for example, when we see a marquee at an old-fashioned movie theater and it looks like the lights are going around in a circle, it's really just a series of single lights flashing on and off. But our minds fill in where our brain leaves off and we create this holistic notion of the circle. And it's the same with these pictures. For me, I start with something that resonates and then I carry it to other places where a little narrative unfolds. And I think for all of us, the narrative has to do with memories we have, people we've met, where we've come from and where we're going. And um, that's a, a little bit about how I think of these. And the great light artist, James Terrell, who's getting a lot of play right now at the Guggenheim in New York and the LA County Museum on the West Coast, Terrell said, we do a lot to form our own reality. We actually give the sky its color as well as its shape. He said, I can change the color of the sky by changing the context of vision. Like in those tests where we see a blue dot on a red versus a green field, the spots change. It's what's behind the eye that forms the reality we create. It's not rational. We form our own reality. Olivia, can we please go to the next one? So this isn't to say that I'm not interested in the basic parameters of photography being the shutter and the frame. I am interested in those things. Of course, Cartier-Bresson said that the decisive moment is when one wraps one's head or puts one's head on the same axis as one's heart and one's eye. Um, I am interested in that moment. I do try to take the picture at the right fraction of a second, but I am almost more interested in the moment before and the moment after and how they come together. And the same with the frame. I do think about where the lines and the shapes and the colors all come together and whether they're creating tension and whether they're creating harmony. But again, I'm more interested in what happens when the images connect and move, move out from the frame. So I'll show you a little bit of the seeds of my visual vocabulary and take you through until this point. So this is one of the first pictures that I made with the, with the Diana camera. And here you can see how they were literally in sequence, one, two, three. You can see the black lines between the frames creating the separations. This picture um, was really my first aha moment, so to speak. The image on the far right is really just a fabric, and because the fabric was the same, the black line and the fabric was the same size as the black line uh, delineating frame two from frame three, it, it feels seamless. And so a little light bulb went off in my head, and I thought, hmm, there's something about that connection, something about combining two bits of information that interests me. And so I literally, this is long before the computer was in our lives, I cut out the insides of the camera. Literally took a knife and cut the insides out so that one image would bleed into the next. And um, it allowed for three and four frames to come together. These were made in California. My family had moved there in 1974, and I love summer. I love the summer light and the warmth um, of that glow. Here you can literally see the circle of the lens because sometimes, you know, the, the little mistakes are, are embraced. And um, so where the pool is, you can see the circle of light. 
During my time at RIT in the summer, I worked for the great documentary photographer, Mary Ellen Mark. Um, I remember seeing Mary Ellen's work, I think, when I was 12 years old. And um, I was very moved by an article that she had, a piece she had done that was in you know, either Life or Look magazine. And so when I went to New York, and she was one of the few women working at the time, so I was drawn towards her, called her, and begged and begged for her to take me on and I worked with Mary Ellen for quite a while and she took me to India with her and that's where I did um, a big series of pictures on India. May I? Yes. A question. The, the, the frame before that was one single piece of this one? celluloid that was printed from? Correct. Okay. So, so these are on two and a quarter film. So literally, if I had a big enough and larger, the piece could be as long as a piece of film because it's just continuous imagery, as is this. I was making these at a, in a home dark room. I was literally washing the prints in the bathtub, squeegeeing them off on the walls, and um, that's how they were made, <laughs> rolling them up in tubes. Pardon me? You were very young when you made these. Pardon me? You were very young when you made these. Yes, in my 20s. Oh, they're wonderful. Thank you. This was, um, this was in Haiti. Um, I did two trips to Haiti. Uh, before a lot of the political turmoil there, I was very much drawn to the culture in Haiti, the spirituality, the people were fantastic, the light, the mystery. Um, and then I had a wonderful uh, gift of taking the pictures. The Museum of Modern Art lets people drop work off there or they used to, and um, I took the work there and I was so lucky to meet John Zarkowski who uh, bought this picture as well as this one and, and included them in an ex exhibition there, which was a, a great highlight. And This picture is not mine, nor are the two following this. I mentioned that I was um, did some classes at um, um, this, the visual studies workshop, and while I was there, I, I was inspired by other photographers who whose work was kind of in the air at the time. This is a piece by Robert Fichter, and there was a very unfettered approach and a very a little bit of a more radical approach to image making that I've actually seen come back today in the 2013 exhibit that's up at the Modern. There's a lot more experimentation. So a lot of experimentation was going on at the time, and Fichter was among them. He said, he took many liberties. I print everything the negative will carry. Dust scratches, figure, image, philosophy, and oh boy, there's some kind of vision here too. Um, and I think this gave me a little bit of a license to balance the rational and the irrational, to get away from the picture as depicting just fact. This is Thomas Barrow. He did a body of work called Dualities, and he said they are pairs that are disparate elements, and those are words that ring true to me. Here again, that phrase that I used in the beginning of after the threshold, other than the sum of the parts, um, that is what happens. This is Robert Heineken. Um, he taught at UCLA and starting in the 60s. He used a lot of unconventional processes and had quite an irreverent attitude. Um, he saw pictures as um, cultural iconography and a reflection of contemporary life. And in 66 and 67, Heineken did a series of pictures called Are You Rea? And he superimposed advertising and features from magazines and exposed both sides at once. So these kinds of images were in the air, so to speak, and were very influential to me. By the mid-80s, I had moved away from the Diana camera and went into the studio and was appropriating. And I was um, doing a lot of editorial work. I'm a child of the 60s. I've watched my share of television. Um, I was doing some uh, stills for MTV um, spots. And these pieces were made by shooting material that was already made 
off of the television screen. So I was running the film through the camera once and then running it through the camera a second time using a real camera, no longer the toy camera. In there you can see the character um, Max Headroom, that small thin head in the center. Uh, Max Headroom was a, like a fictional British character of artificial intelligence, remember him? Um, <clears throat> This piece uh, rings to me um, memories of uh, being a young kid and he hearing those duck and cover ads when you're in school. And uh, uh, the far left reminds me of Levittown and has a little bit of an ominous feel to me. That's Peter Gabriel on the left, and on the right is imagery from Sesame Street. I took imagery from anywhere and everything. In the upper right, the 511 was, was the time of day that I took the photograph. And then I did a series of pictures also in the studio where I was re-photographing famous, well-known artists and superimposing the basic art-making shapes on top of them, the triangle, the circle, the square. So here we have the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. This is a Millet painting. I believe it's called Painting After Van Gogh. And this is a Raphael. In camera? In camera. In ca everything in camera. Pretty straightforward. Not a lot of tricks. Then in um, 1991, I did a trip to Morocco. And I kind of didn't know what camera to take because I had been using, I had gone from the um, Diana to the studio and was re-photographing off of the television. And then I went, uh, I was going out in the world and I wanted to record something but didn't know what to take. So I used a video camera and I just shot tons of video material and came back and made diptychs based on the landscape and the people. And I have lots and lots of these, but I'm just going to show you a few here. And, and again, I put it on the screen, shoot the image off of the television screen. And then I hit an impasse. Um, I hit a difficult time. I wasn't doing as much commercial work. My children were young, banging on my studio door, and it was impossible to not say yes to them, and it was hard to create a body of work. So I switched gears and um, I started to paint. And I'm going to read, and I do not consider myself a painter. I probably couldn't draw this table if I tried. Um, but um, I'm going to read to you something from Twyla Tharp, the great dancer, who wrote a book called The Creative Habit, Learn It and Use It for Life. And Tharp says, the first steps of a creative act are like groping in the dark, random and chaotic, feverish and fearful, a lot of busyness with no apparent or definable end in sight. There's nothing yet to research. For me, these moments are not pretty. I call it scratching. You know how you scratch away at a lottery ticket to see if you've won? That's what I'm doing when I begin. I'm digging to, through everything to find something. It's like clawing at the side of a mountain to get a toehold, a grip, some sort of traction to keep moving upward and onward. Scratching can look like borrowing, but it's an essential part of creativity. It's primal and very private. It's a way of saying to the gods, oh, don't mind me. I'll just wander around in these back hallways and then grabbing that piece of fire and running like hell. Well, I don't think Twilight Art meant to scratch for five years, but that's how long I was away from the camera. And um, I don't consider myself a painter. I, you know, these are very derivative, some of them, but I was interested in putting things together and uh, working in, in for, with formal elements. Now, in a case of something like this, did you create? that with the intent of bringing those images together or is this something where that might be three pieces that you later No, I, I, in t I started probably with that with the big piece mm -hmm. and then moved from there. I made it as one. Okay. Yes. And then I returned to the camera and I know that these images, when I came back to photography, were 
100% informed by the five years of painting. Um, these are straightforward images that were made with, I don't remember, a, a, a Nikon or a Nicker mat, and I made single images hundreds of these, put them on the floor, made diptychs out of them, and um, created a body of work that looks like this. And again, these are about how do these images talk to each other, mostly in formal ways, but, but what is one image saying to the next and how do they connect? So now I'm going to show you the beginning of what became my first monograph, Walking Through the World. And these first three pictures, one, two, three, were really a first aha moment, another aha moment for me. Um, there was something about these that was very meaningful to me. I love summer. I feel very melancholy in September and October. Um, it's a desire to hold on. It has something to do with, I believe, the element of time. Fear of time, fear of time passing. And I put the images together and they became this grid. And Barnett Newman wrote a lot about time. He said, only time can be felt in private. Space is a common property. Only time is personal, a private experience. Each person must feel it for himself. I insist on my experiences of sensations in time. Not the sense of time, but the physical sensation of time. And for me, that's what these pictures became. Something about that sensation. And so I, I started to make these grids, and um, I think of them as being together, but some of the images can come apart, sort of like words, words that can fall apart and become sentences and can become paragraphs. Um, that is how I see these images. Um, this piece is called Land Use Interpretation, and I started with the upper middle image, which is an aerial target used by the Navy, and it's taken from the Center for Land Use Interpretation. And I use the word interpretation as I sort of thought through this piece. Um, the top left and the middle bottom image, I thought of land in a suburban setting. The bottom left is from the pathway on the Oracle to Delphi, and on the bottom right I was thinking about the fracture of, of the earth and what's, what's happening to it. So I kind of use a little bit of intuition and a little bit of uh, formal elements as I bring these together. And as I said, sometimes they're diptychs and sometimes um, they come together in larger and smaller ways. This is called um, a Mill Pond Triptych. This is called Resolve. I had read something about immigration that had moved me and was thinking about displacement and um, the light in most of these images for me is a sign of hope. And again, I'm trying to balance the formal and content qualities. I read something or I heard something once on Radio Lab that um, the, the, about our eyes and how we can't stay focused, ever stay focused on one thing. The, the retina is constantly moving, um, and I, I do think about that in, in my work. This piece is called Sewing Class Cancelled. It, um, it started from an article I read. The bottom middle image was in the New York Times, and it was an article about some women who were taking a sewing class in Ashkargar, Afghanistan. And their teacher was killed on the way to the class, and I was very moved by this. And I just wrote some thoughts on acetate and sandwiched that together to create the writing with the image in the bottom middle. I think of the car as the, the speeding of this professor's car and his being killed, um, the war-torn walls, 
the hope again, the torn culture of the fabric. Sometimes it's just about flowers, and uh, I've done a, a lot of images of flowers over the years. I think about life and decay, and uh, again the frame and the formal elements in the frame, the division of space. This piece is called Secret. It was made in Paris, and I really was just thinking about the female form and the flesh and the, how the flesh is rendered in marble and the natural skin. Again, some of them come out as single images. This is an installation piece that's called Looking Inward, Looking Out, and it's about looking. Um, these pieces could really scan this entire room if I wanted. They go upwards in scale and come down to very small images that could literally almost be sitting on a floor. Um, it depends on the space, and it, it's about activating the space as much as it is the images within it. These are from that same installation. Here it is in a gallery space. I put them up on a top corner of the gallery and they literally had to talk to the images across the way. And it was, it was a challenge and a fun challenge for me to try to make that work. This is not my photograph. Um, this is by Stephen Shore. And at the same time as those photographers who were working in the mid-70s at a Visual Studies Workshop and other places who had that very unfettered approach, there was a whole other approach. And I'm sure Olivia could tell us more than, than I can about the new topographics. But the new topographics in general were a group of nine photographers that were put together by Will Jenkins, who was working at the George Eastman House in 1975. And they were about photographers who focused on the man altered landscape um, and this th these photographers basically documented the ordinary they documented everyday structures in the built environment they had a very neutral um, vernacular approach to image making they objectified these places and Yet the, the very neutral places were confrontational in a way because they depicted this thereness of there, as I like to refer to it. It's, it's encapsulated in this frame, and that's what makes it so there. Um, this particular piece is Stephen Shore, as I mentioned. This is Frank Golke. <clears throat> John Schott. and the wonderful Henry Wessel. And while I was never interested up to this point in depicting fact in my work, these guys influenced many people. Joel Meyerowitz, uh, Joel Sternfeld, Richard Misrak, Mitch Epstein, a generation of photographers were influenced by the new topographics. And so I grew up with those guys, you know, they were sort of in my psyche. And um, even though up until this point it was not something I focused on, I understood it and in some way planting and picking became an homage to that understanding. Um, and it, the project began uh, in a personal way because um, 
My daughter had gone to a farm school in Vermont for a semester of her junior year in high school and in 2008, even though we think that you know the farm to table uh, attitude has been around for a long time, it really hasn't, or at least in the suburbs and places where we're very conscious of it. Um, uh, obviously farming has been around forever, but, but the consciousness of our food ha is, is new. And we, uh, when she graduated from high school, we wanted to show her where it all began. And there's a farm called Green Gulch and Zen Center in Northern California. And they use farming as a Zen process, part of the Zen process. And I, when I was there, I thought, wow, this, this really is, um, is affecting me and I uh, felt very moved by the place and what I was seeing there and the serenity and the beauty in the in the ordinary and I started photographing and it moved into a bigger project which you see on the walls here so um, while I'm interested in the food revelation revolution um, and the alternative to what we call the industrial food pipeline. I'm as interested or probably more interested in these pictures in a photographic way. And what I started to think about within the frame and how everything that before was spreading out for me imploded into the frame. <clears throat> This is called bundled rags. The end of the season. This is greenhouse power. And I was interested in the natural beauty in these places and how so many things are repurposed and, how, and the beauty of what's just laying around and um, the hard work of farming and um, the return to the natural that is always a part of our life cycle. This was here in Brussels. Um, you can tell me the name of the family that owns this farm. No? It's on the Whitman Land Trust in Brussels. Yeah. This was... Oh, sorry. What about your framing choices, like how you sure. make your choices and what to include. And sure. Um, an example like this, there's the stuff in the front, and I just love the mess of all of that. Um, so it's chaotic up there, but then um, I would imagine I framed it like that because the background is so light and so airy and it's this it's that um screening in a greenhouse Even just like the little things like that little edge that's left of that the edge and you know and it's like <laughs> in other places little bits of tree you know i mean there are little obviously choices you made about what to include and, you know. and with work like this it is it's it, i'm very conscious of the frame and i always tell my students that it's what comes in those little tiny pieces on the edges of the frames are what give us it uh, uh, it holds things in a more dynamic way had that been straighter would have been a little less active and um so I do look for those things and that's the contemplative time of looking in making pictures like these. It's, it is, I think I said in my statement, a, a lot of waiting around for the sublime moments, but it's also the sublime moments of looking and waiting. And, but it's also not a traditional framing method, which right. is interesting. I mean, it sort of really makes the, the image more dynamic, but it also sort of slightly jarring at times mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of what's yeah, there's just a little something. Something off. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I do think about those things. Do you work from a tripod? Um, sometimes. This was at Green Gulch. It was just a magnificent place. 
<laughs> and this was one of the last pictures that I made um, for planting and picking. And we didn't put it in the book as a triptych, but it was always intended as a triptych, um, as a physical print. And um, there was just something about it that brought me back to my roots and the long strip pictures that we started with when I talked about the Diana camera. And this just felt like it needed and was more um, uh, whole with the three parts. And this picture led directly into the images that make up after the threshold. And as I said, these pictures are all based on a paradigm of three or four images across one sheet of paper. So similar to that image um, outside in that made that first grid that I showed you, um, these two are about time and longing and wanting to hold on to time. Not all of them, but that's something that I think about. Vicki Goldberg in her essay in the book said, multiple images in sequence are in themselves attempts to extend the limits of photographic time in a single shot. This is called knotted vine. This is Mademoiselle, that's an Angra painting in the third panel. This is Improbable Night, again, it's about those collisions and connections of divergent moments. <clears throat> Serene Hour. Daylight Moon. All over. And I, I reach into my archives when I'm making them. They start with one image and then I play with them. I never make them on the computer screen. I always um, print maybe eight by ten images, put them up on the wall and live with them for a while until they create the poem. This is called Sunday Morning. White sun. This is Mademoiselle, that's uh, Caravaggio on the ground in the far right image. That was at the Villa Bor outside the Villa Borghese. That's the ticket to get into the Villa Borghese where that image, that Caravaggio image is. This is Broken Eclipse. Tattoo. Hidden Man. Again, on radio, I love to listen to Radio Lab, and um, they were talking about memory once and said that um, memory is never without contamination unless it's a memory that we have immediately, right now, from before. So the memory that um, you have of the first meeting and the memory that he or she has of the first meeting is never the same. It's, it's been fictionalized and gone through reinterpretations. So we, again, narrate our own realities and it's a very fluid reality. Where was it in there? This past one? Yeah, I mean, what, was that a museum or? Uh, this piece? Yes, the, the third from the left, the, on the wall. Um, that was in Los Angeles, and it was a commercial building. They just had that little... That little, that little figure. Somebody had sprayed that on the... <coughs> so it was like graffiti? Uh, yeah. <coughs> and it was a very clean building, and I saw that tiny little figure. Um, and then I was lucky to get that shadow yeah, in there. I the shadow. <laughs> That's nice. 
then that piece on the far right is actually what, two pictures, is it? It's not. It is one. It was a, um, there, there was a, a mural on the side of that wall and the palm trees were behind it. Oh, okay. These tend to fool you. They can fool you a little bit, but they're typically very straight. I'm not photoshopping. I really only use Photoshop as a same as a darkroom device to dodge and burn and make the image a little cleaner. <coughs> yep, exactly. This is called haywire. What? Haywire. <laughs> this is called Hannah. And the last one is called um, Night Station. And when I was making this body of work, my New York gallerist said to me, Sandy, you've got to make a video. And I kind of looked at him like he was crazy and um, said, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how the equipment works. I can't do this. Da, 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 da. And um, I finally played with it and did make a little video. And it's a two minute piece that I will end with if my tech support here, Becky, will help me pull that up. There's a little bit of sound that goes with it. Um, that's just ambient sound. Yeah, I noticed she had orbs and spheres and circles. There's often a lot of repeating elements. Mm -hmm. That's Which so nice that you noticed that. To you maybe that you know, then we get to fill in the space. Exactly. So here's the video. Um, it's two minutes, so it can loop. It should go away. No. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Smaller. It needs to go smaller. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. That's good. Yes, but it loops, you know, because it takes a while to, to really see it. And that's, um, that's where I am today. <laughs> Do you anticipate more video work? Excuse me? Do you anticipate doing I hope so. I would like to do more. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it really uh, drives home the points of the narrative and, and the element of time. Thank you. It really does. Thank you. Have you done more videos. I've been shooting. I haven't put them together yet, the hard part, but I've been shooting. So hopefully more will come. It's flattering. Thank <coughs> you. Thanks. So I have a little question. Sure. The first thing you said about the dynamic camera. Yes. Did it have a dreamlike quality? How can a how can a camera have that a personality or well, I, th I think that the camera has certain, certain qualities that lend itself to a dreamy quality. It's a soft focus, it's plastic. Is it so, like an uncoated lens? Yeah, it's just, 
cheap, you know. <laughs> it's just plastic and there's nothing crisp about it. So that lends itself to a very soft interpretation rather than something like a Hasselblad that if I were shooting it right here, it would be crisp. And But yet, I embrace those qualities of dreaminess and so it it feeds into my work regardless of what I'm using. And, then, and I don't use this, I haven't used this for years. And then somehow you decoupled the film advance from the shuttercock. Well, what I did was I just literally cut out the inside of the camera. So, so there's no delineation between frame. And then I did okay. it to a more sophisticated camera. Somebody in New York took a ca real camera and did it for me. Um, more mechanically. I mean, I literally took a saw and just cut out and the... And that little band that separates... Right. So that no longer exists. And, um, <laughs> and now one can do it on a computer really easily, so... Yeah, I was wondering if you'd even considered doing that. No, I mean, I, 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 I like the three and four panels. I think there's a cleanliness to it now, but yet it's still combining images, so I'm more interested in, in that coupling well, of imagery. It gives you a lot more options. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do, do you do much of that work with, the, uh, with, with no delineation still? No. Okay. No, I haven't done that since. That was gorgeous. Thank you. Just, Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's, I don't know, you play it out a little bit as an artist and then you, you use those tools again, but, yeah, I don't know, you just want to explore new things, so, or at least that's the way I work. I mean, some artists do the same thing forever and it's a wonderful way to work as well, but I tend to move in segments. <laughs> well, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And aerodyne as well. <laughs> and Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it all makes sense. I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. Really? We don't want to leave. Can you do a, a, a little song and dance? <laughs> <laughs> you dance. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to see it again because you know you didn't see the very. I think you missed the sound in the very beginning. Um, now let's see if it will go on. No. What did that Becky do? <laughs> There you go. Here, just leave it there so you can hear the sound. That's good.
Thank you. When you shoot the vertical video, are you turning the camera or are you cropping it? I just turn the camera. Yeah. And is it just your DSLR? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. What does that mean, DSLR? Uh, just a digitization video. Okay. Yeah. Digital SLR. Yes. I've noticed that you seem to use little spots of color mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that sort of connect very distant points in your image. Like the pink in the, the yeah. pink flower and, and, and the in, girl. And in this video, mm -hmm. <coughs> the, the two you know, people running on the field right. on the left, and the shirt matches perfectly. The pink. Yeah. <laughs> Do you mess with that when you can? No, I, I don't alter the natural, but I pick the images because of that. You so don't just tint it or no, no. Okay. If that part is all natural, I'm not one for a lot of um, gimmicks and Photoshop. So you just use the video on your, your My digital camera. I do. Ah. Yes. And then it's, 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 it's very stable too. Yeah. Well, I use a monopod. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty stable. Well, I love how it's just absolutely just an extension of the still. Image. Exactly. Exactly. It came pretty naturally. Yeah. So I hope to do more. It's challenging and um, exciting at the same time. And, and so when you do all this different footage, and then you. And, Stitch it together in the computer? Or? Stitch it together, there's programs to use. Um, iMovie or um, right. various yeah. other programs. Yeah. Well, it's very seamless, very smooth. Yeah. And uh, I know there must be a sequence. So I, the well, that's, happens so slowly. that takes time to work out, and how one, in a way, it's very similar to the stills because I think of them starting from yeah. the still. Yes. And then the flow has to, so it's just a, a more involved process. That's right. It's not really a big departure from the stills. Right. It's more like an extension. Right. Of but it gets deeper in. Right. Mm -hmm. And what about the sound? The sound was, I, I thought about that uh, quite a while, and I'm not, um, I don't know a lot about music, and I thought of using um, all kinds of things, but I ended up with the ambient sound. Yeah, I like and I felt like sense. the ambient sound was just the most um, beautiful in a way. I because agree. It's mantle cool. too. Yeah, I agree yeah. Too. And I think that gives me something to play with that I think in the future, you know, maybe it's the sound from one frame that will go into the next section or, you know, there's a lot that I can do with that sound. It seems to work. I mean, it, it adds a certain authenticity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. not music Thanks. that seems another entire sort of element mm -hmm. that requires a different type of thought process. I mean, it seems perfectly natural. Mm -hmm. Once again, it's an extension of the mm -hmm. sound of music in this context. Yeah, I mean, I think music would be wonderful too, yeah. but that there's a certain realness to having that right. sort of ambient sound, sound that goes with all of right. that. Like in the water, I love that sound. Mm -hmm. the water music has its own connotations, mm -hmm. so it would interfere, I think, with Right. The image. I mean, you could use it. You could use some dissonant music, or mm -hmm. um, yeah. But again, I that's not my territory. So <laughs> that would be a large challenge. It would be. But, but yeah. video wasn't your territory. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm it is so video. impressed with it was your your dealer who said you got to do it. You got to do it. That that's was it. a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, he tends to push us. Yeah. You, wrote, you rose to the challenge beautifully with it keeping within, you know, the whole concept of your work, which I think is really well, I hope you'll do that video. Thanks. How about Thanks. scratching around with pots and pans <laughs> and then letting it go? Yeah, I think you should make some videos. <laughs> I wish we recorded your talk. I think yeah. it was fascinating. Somebody did. Somebody yeah. recorded it? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Did you, did you, uh, did you record it? Record it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh oh, good, 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 good. good. Uh, because I, I hope that, I think they would be the kind of thing that would, I mean, I, I would, I would, I think I'd like to hear it again. Oh, and thank I bet you. we could share it maybe, and I don't know how that would work. You know, I mean, I was, you know what I'm saying? We'll keep up with that.
<laughs> the talk could be packaged. Yeah, oh. exactly. I think so. I, I do think so. Wow, well, thank you. That's quite yeah. a compliment. Well, so thank you for listening. And for your pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. And yeah. for all the support, really. It's been great to be here. <laughs> <laughs>